So let's start going. Uh, we can do a little bit of review as far as um, what's going on on the site for the remote people and their, as their, the local people are joining here. I'm at, in my room here. So, uh, um, yeah, so let's look at where, where the house is. And we pretty much, yeah, um, largely done and moving forward right on it it's uh let's take a look at some of the videos on it just to see where we are we kind of took a break from all the design lessons as we were just everyone was like let's get this thing finished it, it's like a lot of learnings uh so take a look at the videos here so so if you haven't seen the progress um let me share my screen as well entire screen share Okay, so my screen is being shared. So take a look at this. I mean, it's a house, first, second floor, uh, up to the carport. Now it's interior finishing is where we're at. And we're, we're shifting now into the more of the machine. So pretty much we're going to get hire some people to finish this up here. And it's like, whoa, what's going on here? So much time. Yeah, it's, it does take a lot of time because uh if we're trying to do design work and teaching and building at the same time it's 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 an extensive process it's uh but there's a lot of learnings and also major major simplifications like we definitely did not deliver the the model where you can do a one week on a build at this point uh but that's good news because we've got we've got uh modifications that we need to do so i'll discuss that the, some of the main things um so for perspective in terms of the, the build process, uh, let's see, let me make sure. Uh, also take a look at um, take a look at the presentation notes here from today. Um, here's the chat. Here's the, the working doc. Uh, so what's um, what are some of the learnings? Uh, from here, we want to go into a, a process which is self-aligning for the wall modules. Right now, what we're doing with laying the modules without a kind of a polka yoke system, Google that or look that up on, on, on Wikipedia, foolproofing. How do you get things to line up properly without any, um, any sweat? So for example, when we're laying the walls, okay, where do you lay them? On a sill plate, they could move back and forward, side to side, <laughs> took a long time. We were we ended up doing a little blocking to to make make sure the walls align. Uh, on the top, so we would do blocking like nail one to the next one so we can uh, make them all align. But it's like okay, definitely too much. Uh, the ideal is about no more than five minutes per panel. So imagine you've got the walls, well all all the wall panels made. So this is the part where people do this at their leisure time over however much time they need, weekends, nights, if you do the DIY construction method. Uh, it's possible. We gotta say that once you get to the second story, it gets tricky because you gotta get up there. Uh, so you need scaffolding or a tractor to put the panels up there. They're, they're up to, they're like 150 pounds, so, so not light. Uh, first floor, easy. Second floor gets a little tricky because you're at height. But, what happens if you do five minutes per pound? That's that's our. We want to prove that September one through the fourteenth, we're going to prove that. So I think I think based on the learning. So um, five minutes times fifty panels altogether, four hours for the the wall install. That's our next goal. Did not reach it. It took at the ideal case, it took us maybe five minutes to do the best panel where everything lined up magically and there was no nothing to worry about. Uh, in the worst case might have taken us an hour, two hours to get one panel in. Crazy. Uh, so what are some of the difficulties? If you look at, uh, so I'm going to go to the design, the, the actual working doc. Um, need, so we need a seamless inst install of walls. So on the first floor, there's insulation on the on a foundation. There's flexible vinyl flashing. Because it's all squishy and flexible, it's hard to see the clear location of the first story walls. We're going to kill that. We're going to address that. I mentioned polka yoke is required for alignment of second story walls and first first story walls. How do we do it? I'll show that next page. Another review, piece of review is Bob Berkebeel suggested moving away from T111 siding, which lasts 20 years, and going to cement board, which is 50 year lifetime, not too much more cost, thus qualifies it as OSC lifetime design. That's it. Uh, that was kind of a pain point thinking about, okay, well, um, 
20 years. That is not lifetime design. You got to replace the whole siding in 20 years. No, -uh, let's forget about that. 50 years is the warranty on the cement board you, you can see linked. Uh, that means it probably lasts longer than that. Good. It's made of cement and it's made of wood and fiber. Um, those ingredients make for lifetime. Okay. Um, if we do that, we can't do our current construction method of, of using the, the T111 siding as the siding and, sh and final finish. Uh, as the shear stabilizer. So panels are used for shear. There's a concept of shear. There's the concept of final finish. We have to divide that into two. One, for shear, we're going to do OSB, which is under the final siding, and then do the final siding. Now, this is also a matter of practice. We can't combine the two. Um, one matter of practice is that, that the cement board weighs 79 pounds compared to about 45, so much, more, much heavier. If we did cement board and OSB, these panels would be like 250 pounds, not doable. Uh, so we gotta uh, keep the put the OSB on first, and that then put on the final sheeting at the end. That breaks the modularity. Got to do it. Uh, breaks the modularity somewhat. It means that you're gonna do an extra rapid install of the walls, but then you have to put the final paneling on it. First, once again, first floor not a problem. Second floor, you're at height. Um, and then what was the concept of adjustment panels? What if your wall is lined up exactly to be not like like maybe one inch over the, the 32 by 16 footprint? The wall doesn't fit. We had to cut down panels, major pain point. We're gonna avoid that, so, and I'll talk more about it. So, okay, so here's the solutions. Uh, think, so let's learn from structural insulated panels, which many of you may have heard about, but it's the same concept. So. Uh, if you go to structural insulated panels, what you see is that those things have an edge where um, a next panel s slips into it, perfect alignment on the side. Next, the bottom plate, it sits on one, perfect alignment at the bottom. There's a notch at the top, top plate goes on top, perfect alignment. This has all been solved. So how do we do that with a DIY s SIP panel? Here it is, download the CAD go to the wiki uh, and I'll show my screen here so you can download this file but here's what here's the concept the, the working model for what I think would be uh, good right now if anyone has any better suggestions go ahead but uh, here's the deal so you've got our panel um, so this is exterior and this this would be like your first panel so you you put the, the OSB and now here I did 10 foot OSB uh, and I'll explain that. You can get 10 foot OSB, you can get 9 foot, you can get 8 foot. Um, the concept is, here's your lip on the side. So when you put the next panel in, see that little lip on the side there? This part of the former panel moves in. Actually this block, actually now that I look at it here, that block um, needs to move in to the side. I'll explain. Um, move this block over a little bit to the side like this. There it goes. Uh, so so now you've, what you've got here is you've got this part protruding and you can stick it in between the, the next panel's protrusions like this. So this is effectively the same function as a structural insulated panel in terms of how they go together. You have one part going inside another. What about the bottom? Let's put it on a sill plate. What happened there? Self-aligning. Now we're going to take these blocks off at the end because these are alignment blocks. Uh, but the plywood, so we're going to take them off after this is done. The house is standing. We're going to take these off. Uh, but the concept is self-alignment. Um, so you got bottom and what about top? We go to the top. Once again, self-aligning. So once you put it in the top plate, you align all the panels. So uh, that's, that seems to me like the like the foolproof way to do it. We would still have insulation inside, not drawn here. And we would have um, not the house wrap. 
this does not allow you to do house wrap. House wrap was a pain point. It, it was, it's like you're trying to get it in between the panels, hanging down from one layer to the next. Um, so if we do this method, you got to house wrap it at the end. You put up your entire house, house wrap it at that point. So that's how it, ha how it has to work. Now what about this lip here? So that's actually a learning point from if we put the second story platform here, the rim joist would go against it so you can screw it into this. So you've got a, a, a boundary and a self-aligning boundary for the, the second story platform here as well. So I, I would propose this is what we do um, for the next time. If anyone's got any better ideas, that's um, open to that. Uh, I think this is this is a slight modification of what we're doing already. It's still the same uh, four by eight uh, or four by nine kind of a structure. But this actually addresses that, that mid-band, which already is included on this panel, which we otherwise would have to cut. The mid-band that was empty before, because the siding panels that we were using before only come in eight-foot sections. So if you remember, we had the blocking on top. Um, um, so we avoid the blocking on top. We'll still have the blocking on the bottom here for the utility channel, but uh, no blocking on top. So that's, that's a download of the, the kind of iteration we can do. So any comments on this? Any thoughts? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Everyone, March Yeah. No, I think it's a pretty good addition. Um, anything that makes it more foolproof and a little bit easier to, to make sure you have right is mm -hmm. good for the design. Yeah. And it still has all the same features without losing the modularity. Yeah. Just different steps you have to take. Yeah, um, I, I don't see any, any more than like, if you look at some videos of structural insulated panels, how they go together. And these are now small size. These are basically hum, human scale insulate, uh, structural insulated panels, DIY version of it. So um, with this, I wanna see like five minutes, like one panel, next panel, slip it in over the, the bottom plate and, and, and make it butt into the next one with a self lining mechanism. That's got to work. Um, only issues I can see, perhaps, is if if you've got like you know one panel next next to one panel to the next. Well, what if that you know you kind of catch on the edge here? Well, I don't know. Um, that's that would be the only trouble spot where that if it does catch on the edge between this edge and this edge, then you might have to like kind of grind down the edge here because. Um, th that would be my only uh, concern here, but um, if we're using uh, OSB, that's pretty uniform, so it shouldn't be warped. Like the OSB tends to be quite uniform. The good thing about this is that because you have this long edge, you also have a clear uh, straight edge here because you can mark you can mark exactly against the factory edge of the OSB here, and therefore when this wood, the two by sixes, they can be all kinds of warps in them. Uh, like we've seen, they, they can get warped up. Um, so if you're screwing against the OSB, you'll straighten them out too. So I think the fit could be very tight. Now, how do you address the, the final point of the adjustment panels? I don't know. I mean, I would probably do, maybe make the, if we don't want to cut any panels down in size, just use the full four by eight, we'd have to extend the foundation size by like a, by probably like two inches on the long side and one inch on the short side um, if we're using a sill, st still using a sill gasket here, we have to account for the sill gasket building up over time, over, over the many modules. But probably, I don't know, like, it's probably easier to, um, I mean, we have to think about it. What's easier? Do you want to cut down a panel and make one of these panels non-uniform? Or do you want to just increase the foundation size? Um, I don't know, it's kind of up for grabs. Uh, then what do you do about the corners? So the corner modules, you'd also want to have um, a mechanism where you slip in like this. So we have to design a, a, just a special corner piece where this panel may have like the protrusion coming out, like just like we built the specialized corner panels before. They have the, the, the siding on them. So the panel next door fits once again into the slot here. So we might put like the, the OSB on this side here and uh, 
um, make that notching, basically the slotting system happen on the corner. Uh, so a little bit of detail there, it shouldn't be um, much, much to worry about. Um, uh, some more details like that. So let's revisit the foundation thing. So here, this is problem. Here. Go ahead. Bef before you go, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. How you're, you're, you're saying this kind of like a DIY uh, SIP. Yeah. How, how are these better than SIPs? Like, why aren't we just using SIPs? Uh, probably one third the cost. <clears throat> so That's a good actually, reason. Yeah, it's probably, uh, look at, let's, I don't know if you can find some cost estimates. Now for SIPs, what you have to do is, I'm not sure they make panels that are of this small size. And then if you, if you do that, you have to cut them and there's foam inside. So you have to have just other specialized tools to kind of like push back the foam or uh, cutting is, is, I guess, not too bad. You can cut it with a circular saw, but then um, I'm not sure anybody makes something that would work for the way we want to do it. And the, the for, but the first reason before that is price though. Th those things are, um, actually that would be a good good thing. I've looked at prices before. They're, they're not cheaper than, than regular. Uh, but we can do a com comparison for it. Um, let's see, what else would be, like if we use, now the, the sips that come from the store, they're actually I think a little thicker. Not sure if you can get exactly what we have. Um, but actually that's, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, the supply chain is gonna be an issue because I'm not sure if there are, yeah, I, I actually don't know a bunch, uh, a, a lot about the SIP market, but um, I know that there's large sized ones. I'm not sure how easy it is to find four by eight sips. So let's see if you Google real quick, four by eight foot SIPs. Um, four by eight, yeah, they got them. Um, well, 300 bucks for the panel itself. Uh, without the exterior siding, so you're talking about yeah, just just about right. Uh, for us, it's about a hundred versus three hundred. Well, this well more like three twenty-four here for six. Well, this is comparable somewhere between this and that. So the first website we looked at is three hundred. We're about at a hundred without. Um, if you look at uh, the the basic question is. What are you getting? You're getting insulation. So, so yeah, let's do this in our head real quick. Insulation is the, the kind of insulation we use, the fiberglass is about a dollar a square foot. So you're talking about $32 in insulation for four by eight. And then the other main expense is two by six lumber. So you go to Menards, two by six, two by six lumber. That's the cheapest place we know. Um, what is one of these things? Like 12 bucks, 10 bucks? Let's see, what's the cheapest we can get for an eight footer, let's say. Um, they're between 11 and $13. No, no, that's none. Oh, look, we're pretty good, actually. Oh, look, they're only seven sixty-seven. So this, this actually, <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> Last we looked, they were $15. That was three months ago. So uh, eight footer is only seven, like under 10 bucks. So if you're using about five, you're talk, talking about 50 in, in the wood, and then 30 in insulation, so 80 compared to 300. So it's like about a quarter quarter the cost for your DIY SIP panels. Um, yeah, any other questions before we move on? Okay, um, let's keep going. So a further detail, so we've, say we've got these, um, the system now on the foundation. Uh, what do we do for the insulation? The thing, the thing that was troubling us before was that we did this kind of insulation here, just a square piece of insulation in front. And there was some mess like around how that worked. We kind of did this before. Before we did something like this, that was our pink insulation on the side. And then for the shallow insulated footer, which looks like this, basically you got insulation going out the side like this. So that's that's the current method. Uh, I think for the next time, um, I think just do this. 
you got a hard edge here for you got a hard edge for aligning the panel well yeah something this is not worked out this is just con conceptually speaking um, put this cut the insulation so you don't get this this straight edge here which water can get trapped in there so so we'll have to do a cut on the insulation and go from there um, not not too bad next um, I mentioned these plywoods these OSBs come in come in different sizes 8 9 and 10 which allows us to do this here shown as 10 which could accommodate the alignment of the second story platform without that the danger of that falling on your head so that at this point you're actually working from inside and people outside could <laughs> could screw this in um, but yeah so similar process um, just some simplifications to think about so that's kind of it oh <laughs> uh, we're gonna clean up the site here for, and, and get another shipment so that's it um, we're rolling uh, workshop is in two weeks uh, we're keeping just about everything I identical uh, except to rework the panel design so that it, it's seamless now 14 days with uh, 20 there's gonna be 24 people at the workshop we should not have any problem doing that um, it'll be where we're building and not so much fighting the <laughs> how the panels align man yeah we, we learned a lot I think I think there's a lot of a lot of learning of, of what's easy and what's not okay um, that's a quick quick overview and take a look at some of the videos you can study the videotape here for what what we do I mean I don't know if you look at so so look at how we're putting up the wall panels uh, say um, corners those emotions they were put on hold by time like I mean look at this here so well I don't know if you can see this here how do you do this well you have to shuff, shuffle it back and forth you have to there's too many uh, degrees of freedom here like if you think about it um, so if you look at we, we first put up the corners but if you you know take a look at this process how we get this panel on you've got this f fluffy this fuzzy edge from the, the vinyl flashing you've got the fuzzy edge from the insulation there uh, the lip cat does catch it somewhat but you know it's like you kind of it looks pretty easy like on the videotape it looks actually pretty easy but you keep you can kind of see it shuffling back and forth because the insulation here is soft and it's about quality control like really how quality how well the corners end up fitting together and how well the seams end up lining up if you have all these little inaccuracies so I would say that Oh look, we this this kind of blew over a little bit. Um, yeah, um, from the from the outside, if you look at it, you cannot you maybe not don't really see the difference. But if you if you um, if you actually done it, then yeah, there's too many too many degrees of freedom, uh, which we're gonna eliminate the next time around. So you can watch through a lot of the different videos. Okay, but let's now we're switching topics. So the next two weeks we're pretty much um, order materials, finish up the the house by hiring some people here, and then getting ready for the site to be uh, for the workshop. Uh, in the meantime, we're gonna do a couple, a few things like uh, get the torch table up and running, and do the the we call it I like to call this a universal prototyping structure, which is gonna be a 50 by 60 concrete slab with columns and a solar actually a solar roof that we're going to start on we're going to get a part of this built we can use part of the um, foundation for practice during the workshop and right now we're looking at putting the house right on that as a and then we're going to take the house down so we're interesting right uh, but we're, we're designing it in a way that it's, is now minor redesign to make it a little easier to take apart but what we're looking at is you get the main get the practice of just about everything on a house but you'll uh, and get the absolute finished look on it the interior um, other things we can practice on dedicated practice modules like how do you install the bathroom well here it is we'll, we'll maybe take that we might do that in the house or maybe like set it up on a concrete pad and, and do it like as a here's like a class 
more like a classroom setting where you can see it more clearly as opposed to it going into the house. We can do either, but if we're going to... Uh, our, our concept right now is let's use this foundation pad for multiple workshops where probably like every quarter we run a CD Go Home build as a tr two week training workshop. So that's that's kind of the idea. So we don't want to be popping up a house every time. Um, if we want to make this a repeat event, which we're looking at, um, that's then we can take it apart. Okay, but Universal axes, talking about machines, um, switching gears, quite quite the switch of gears here. Um, so what's to be said about the universal axis based CNC machines? It's that we can build them at any size and shape using any kind of XYZ configuration. It's still rectilinear. It can't have rotating axes using the universal axis, which is described here in this link. So you can take a look at this. Um, the small axis is what we build for the D3D Universal and some of the D3D Pros. We can enlarge it. Here's some taller and larger machines. Or you can enlarge it to, for size comparison, this is the 516 versus the 1 inch. And you can go up to 2 inch. We've done up to 2 inch where these things are big now. They're, that's the, we never finished this, but that's, we, we did the Universal Axis pieces. That, I mean, this is the for size reference. Those are getting pretty huge with 2 inch rods. This year we're going to do a lot of the one inch size scale, which allows us to do well on four by four by eight foot size 3D printers. Whoa, that's pretty huge. That's the, that's the equivalent of a printer that you get for tens of thousands of dollars. It will cost us about 5,000 in parts for a large printer that with an insulated heat bed. We can do wire arc additive manufacturing, basically mounting a welder head on top of this kind of one inch universal axis, or you can do the CNC torch table head which is what we did on a D3D CNC torch table. So the application, if you go to CNC torch table genealogy, the la this is uh, the last build. That's the one inch universal axis, including Z. That's, that's the Y axis here. We're gonna work with this structure. We have this. Uh, we, we ran it, but it was too wobbly. So we're redoing it. Uh, we're gonna re redo the the axes. But the point is, how do you get to design um, this kind of an axis system? Say you had to um, build the universal axis from scratch. We've got these pieces already, but I think we want to optimize them a little bit, maybe change them around. Like, um, If we need to modify for maybe like a different configuration that the current, current geometry does not allow, we can do that. Um, so let's talk about how you do that. So first you start with frames and frames in general you can we've done things in different ways from the okay so latest is actually using space structure frames out of welded rebar like this large workshop. This is actually what we're going to be building. Actually Jeff is welding up one of these trusses like right now I think. Um, we've done large frames like this is half inch steel here which is four sheets that are welded flat sorry, four pieces of, of flat, quarter by, which, sorry, it's half by four flats here, welded into one side, a flat side, and we made six of these sides, and then put six of these sides together into a cube. That's a, that's a way to make super heavy duty frames. We've also done these similar technique as, as this here. This, is, this technique is the same as here. Here we're taking, once again, these are CNC cut, but these are just one eighth inch small frames once again, six pieces, six piece, six flat pieces that are then welded into a cube, which is self-aligning. We've also done a lot of with this box beam tubing for larger things like tractors, iron workers, torch table frames. And we, we also do the corners. This is actually a very good way to do it if you've got angle, because angle is ready available and you can 3D print corners and this gets you a perfect frame every time. Uh, so you can do this without, so the advantage here is you're just using angle, which is cut, as opposed to this, like these frames here, this frame here, that we got CNC cut. So if you don't have a CNC cutter, it's hard to do this one. So the easiest way if you have a 3D printer and a metal cutoff saw is this kind of frame here. Um, and if you want to do huge size, you take flat bar, weld it into four-sided flat frames, and then put them together. And why do that? Why do these six frames that then weld them together? 
it's just alignment. Imagine if you had to do like first, well, you could take, well, let's discuss this, the, the concept of why not take, in this case, why not take four by four by half angle and do the same? Well, it gets tricky around the corners and alignment. How do you stand up four verticals to be perfectly ve vertical? It's a lot of measuring and using a, a square, a lot of square, you could do that like a hundred times to get it all squared up. Here, all you need to do is make sure you can build a square frame on a flat table, easy. And then when you make six frames, six sides like that, which are all decent because you made them in a controlled environment like on a flat table, that's easy. Well, when you have six of those and you put them together, they self-align. So the fabrication process is actually much simpler. So if you want to do a huge frame, like say we want to do, uh, okay, we, we do the four by four by eight foot large printer. How are we going to do it? Uh, well, it's a non-contact device. It doesn't have to be super strong. Um, it does have to hold a heavy bed, like in terms of 100 or 200 pounds of print. Yeah, the bed itself is going to be 100 pounds or a couple of 100 pounds if you lift a person. It's huge. Uh, how would you do it? We can do something of this nature where we use like quarter, uh, like say half, oh maybe quarter, yeah, quarter by four flats that are made into four large sides that are then uh, welded as the six sides together. One way to do it, I would actually favor this way. So how about we print the uh, use quarter by four angle, three print corners. Not structural corners, because we're gonna weld this up later, but corners just to hold the structure in perfect alignment. So what I would do is use the fact that we have 3D printers for rapid prototyping of geometries. We can make a lightweight corner into which we insert quarter by four angle. And then we, we basically lay up this entire huge frame out of quarter by four. Uh, that would be plenty of strength for the scale of a few hundred pounds of loads, such as the weight of the prints or the weight of the bed, uh, of the print bed. Uh, but the corners, plastic is only so strong, so unless, so the two choices are make super heavy corners out of plastic, which now is going to be like a spool per corner. <laughs> uh, we could do that, but it'd take a, a day per corner. Well, we could do it. Uh, run like eight printers at one time and you have it in one day, or you run pr one printer for eight days and you have it after eight days. Uh, and this is now, I'm talking about 1.2 millimeter nozzles. I'm not talking about 1.04 nozzles. We're, we're talking about there's so much mass you're printing here that uh, for what we want to do here, this is not 0.4 millimeter nozzle territory. This is you got to go at least 1.2 millimeter nozzles and that's why we use them because we want to print industrial grade kind of materials. Uh, sizes. So what I would do is uh, print the corners and then we uh, we weld up the rest like like maybe do like try like triangle corner supports in between so so you've got this pretty much a sacrificial holding um, holding corner piece just like we use on a very small frame just one of these but but take some meat out like don't uh, light infill probably holes in it because you don't need the structure it's just to hold because uh, the constraint here is the print time for one of these corners like right now one of these corners takes four hours and it's just for the small frame right so you're talking about 24 hours for like a large corner for a frame of this size here um, well, so we want to save some meat off that corner piece, just poke a bunch of holes through it in CAD and make it as lightweight as possible, just enough to hold the corners. It's, it's effectively like a, just a holding corner. So it's a modified, think of this and like eliminate all the mass from this. So it's not the fully functional corner, it's just a thing that, that has enough strength so it can hold your, hold your uh, metal pieces. How, how weighty are the quarter by four pieces? No, they'll be like, I don't know, like, 50 pounds for the eight foot member or so. Um, so the whole whole frame is several hundred pounds, like in a quarter inch material, quarter by four angle. So that's the technical details there. But 
uh, th this is what we're going to have to consider that, okay, first we need a cluster of printers if we're going to involve printers in this. Otherwise, you're just straight to welding and, and doing this a little more brutally. Uh, but I think the, the combo of 3D printing is quite attractive. Now, we can also do it by taking quarter by four angle and trying to weld the corners together, but ah, that's really hard to hold that. You're going to spend a bit of effort in trying to hold the thing together and align it. That's why I'm suggesting the corners because they are basically a self-aligning mechanism. We'll see. We'll see in practice. This, this gets to quite significant scale. This gets to the scale of our modules that we're working on in the house. So that's big. That's big stuff. And we're going to need all the help we can get on, on, on uh, aligning this. But for now, we don't have to worry about it. We got, um, we got, uh, what do we have for now? We, we do have, um, so CNC torch table, we have this already. That's, that's a four by four by, about a four by four by four frame. So we're talking about way bigger than this. As you can see, it's going to get a little tricky. All right, so we can make, make frames of any size. Now, if we talk about more than like eight foot frames, you go to this, space frames. Space frames are the most efficient structure for uh, building things. This is 16 by 16 um, squares here, 16 by 16 feet. Now, the advantage of this workshop I mentioned is that, for example, between two posts, you can hang an axis, like a universal axis. So this is like both a structure and a gantry mounting system for super large CNC machines like a sawmill or a large torch table. So this gets pretty crazy. What I'm talking about is like pretty far out, but that's what we can do out of this, uh, out of the workshop structure that we built. And it's gonna be solar PV with a roofless roof. Uh, look up roofless roof. <laughs> uh, uh, just uh, if you haven't seen it. It's effectively a way to mount PV panels without using a roof underneath them while still maintaining it watertight. We're going to prototype that, do a quick partial prototype over the next couple of weeks. But well, basically you use channels or gutters, structural channel between the panels to make it watertight. Anyway, um, we covered the scaling the universal axis, universal frames. Universal axis mentioned we can go up to one inch. One inch is all we're going to need for the torch tables. Um, 3D printers, so basically this kind of a thing. And then we need to do the, redo the controller. So how do you do, so now we have built the, this thing right here, the universal controller looks like, it's all, this is the panel that we put on the D3D Pro, but the universal has all these components. You got the ramps, you've got the LCD screen, solid state relay, the power supply, plug, GFCI, and that's it, cool. Okay, what if you want to, and, and, and um, if you zoom in on uh, the little ramps, these are the stepper drivers with a heat sink. Those are the tiny ones. They run the small NEMA 17 stepper motors. If you want to run bigger stuff, you do this. TB6600 uh, stepper drivers. If you Google that, TB66, that's a very common industry standard kind of a thing. This is an external stepper driver that just by connecting a couple of wires from your ramps, 3D printer controller that called the universal controller, you can run big motors off of this. How do you wire it? This is how you do it. So instead of putting on one of the stepper drivers, the tiny ones, you do four, I guess it's four connections total. Um, and that's the, if you look at the pinout, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically you'll see the labels. If you look at one of these things, you see all these labels for what the pins are. What are all the pins there? That's what we got. We got a bunch of these. Uh, so each one of you can get one of these to wire up. Uh, what I suggest you practice wiring this up because we're going to be using that throughout Summer X. Uh, but the concept is just follow this diagram. The stepper motor has four leads, which is just an adjacent leads to one another, and that's A, A plus, A minus, B plus, B minus, B minus. Power, uh, an external power supply needs to get connected to this. This is not running off the, the ramp or current universal control power supply. We need more power here. The, the ramps cannot handle this. The current little, um, if you look at our universal controller, where is that? 
let's let's go back to the D3 CNC torch table. If you look at uh, what we've got there in this, so let's go here. What we got here, we actually have. So this is what we do. This is our regular stuff that we know already, but on top is a separate power supply for the big drivers and wires from wires that this is actually not wired completely, you know, missing those four wires. Um, but that's that's what it looks like. You've got, here's what it, the finished product looks like. You need a separate power supply, which we've got a bunch of those for this exter external stepper drivers. As you notice here, the, the, the tiny little drivers are not found on a board. Instead, we're just plugging in wires into those respective pinholes, uh, like here. So, I mean, this is pretty much what we got to take a look at. Um, exactly like this. You just copy this, uh, copy the wire, the wire to the exact terminals on the stepper driver, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, this one wire gets multiplied into three, so you can. You can and the way you do it, you can plug it into this one terminal here and run a jumper, run a small wire from there, and then another wire from there. Uh, these are separate. These other three are separate wires. That's it. You can practice that uh, today. So that's that's how we scale the axis. Any questions on this um, on this thing? So now, if you understand how to do this, you can pretty much make any kind of a machine of any size. Uh, the concept of the universal controller, uh, if you go back to here, to the way this looks here, well, what do you do here? What does this controller allow you to do? Let's just talk about functionality. So if you want to make a torch table, what else do you need? Well, you need some motion, universal axis. You need uh, four or f probably four. We have, we're probably going to use... 2y, 1x, 2z, either that or do 2y, 2x, and 1z, so like five axes. So we're gonna need, well here we use three in this, this torch table that we did. We did um, one driver for the two y's, one driver for the X and one driver for the Z. So you can do each one of these large drivers can run very safely. We can do two of the larger stepper motors that we have. Uh, there's, if you look at the ramps itself, it's got five channels. So you can do 10 stepper motors at one time out of the box before you actually start tapping other pins on the ramps board to do more of that control. More control if you have more than 10 axes. Okay, what else do we include here? We have the ability to turn on large loads through the solid state relay. Like for example, we turn on a heater bed. Uh, in our case here, what's a large load that we turn on? Not really anything. We don't have large loads, but we can still use this kind of a solid state relay to do things like turn on gas for the torch, turn on the igniter for the torch. Uh, but you can actually, like for the, the gas turn on, you can use D8, D9, D10. You know how we run the heater element and the heat bed. All of those terminals, which I'm pointing to there, they can handle like one or two amps. So they can control the gas or control the well, the igniter, no, the igniter is a 120 volt, so you'd have to do, do an external stepper, sorry, external uh, relay, which uses a small signal from the controller to control a large AC load, AC or DC load, but primarily AC. Uh, what else do you have on the universal controller? Sensors. You've got three temperature sensors. You've got end stops for position detection, and you've got pretty much dozens of pins available that can be used as switches. So for example, if you've got a bunch of different solenoids, like for the, the aquaponic greenhouse, if you've got like a bunch of uh, motors you want to turn on, you can pretty much take any of the multiple 
pins on the Arduino, run them through a relay such as this one, and control that load through it. So for example, a solenoid, DC solenoid, you, you take, you just need one of the numerous extra pins. There's a bunch of extra pins that are not used when we run the RAMPS system here. So there you go. Now, what about the LCD screen? So the LCD screen can be programmed. So for example, you can through the LCD screen, for example, run, well, with Marlin, what we can do right now, we can generate G code, put it on an SD card and run it straight straight off. Now, the interface is gonna look like the printer interface if you have the, the Marlin software. So the case for programming here be would be, okay, now, do the interface dedicated for torch table function. So then the, the, the screen would look like, more like, okay, turn on gas or test igniter or whatever other functions are specific to a torch table. So what are those things specific to a torch table? You have to turn on acetylene and oxygen, in our case. You can turn on the igniter for auto ignition, which we actually have. Or you can do things like, we want to use a Z-probe system. So we can still use the Z-probe, uh, which would have to be protected because it's going to have to be near the torch head. But So the torch head, how does it look like this monster here at the end of the day? Just to show you what the torch head ends up looking like. Um, so here, yeah, this is, this is effectively like what the torch system is. It's a bunch of gas solenoids hoses and a torch head. We just sliced off the body of the torch with its levers and all that and just replaced that with electric solenoids. So that's what the final product looks, looks like pretty much. Um, there's a, this is the Z-axis that we used last time. Stepper motor, three gas control solenoids and these go to the, basically to this nozzle here. And it's a three hose system because you, you need to control oxygen and acetylene for a burn and then you need to control another stream of high pressure oxygen for a cut. Um, so that's kind of how it, look at this, that's your, <laughs> this is your head for like the minimum viable product for your torch head. You, uh, turn this on with ramps and you can burn things and you can slice through through seven inches of steel like butter. So that's pretty cool. Um, Pretty powerful. We can do things like, why is this important? Tracks for tractors, sprockets, gear downs. Um, yeah, sprockets for gear downs, like for example, for the low cost uh, shredder, shredder blades, everything. You name it, brick press, you got it. Very important. Um, what else? That's about it. Uh, so that's how you build the torch table. Um, if you're building a, a wire arc additive manufacturing device, what do you do? You have the XYZ axes, you got the large stepper motors, you've got a simple trigger, so the, it's a welder head, that's MIG welder head that's on an XYZ gantry. So if you do that, all you need to do is trigger the welder on. That's all. So basically one output, just like we have ramps, you know, you, got, you can turn on your heater or whatever. We can take, for example, the heater output and use that to trigger the the welder on just depress the trigger like you have on a gun trigger on a on a weld on a welder so the modification to a welder is one mount the torch head on a on a universal axis and two break into the the switch so you can switch it through ramps as opposed to triggering it manually so basically take the wire that does the trigger and do a relay that closes that that trigger whenever but you do that automatically through ramps and that would get you your automated torch otherwise you can do even simpler you can just say okay i'm running the the wire arc additive manufacturing which is 3d metal printing i'm running that i simply depress the head the trigger and burn from there uh well you have less control you, you if you you can do jumps you, that's just continuous structure like for example if you had to 3D print a large sprocket, you could do that. Because you the, the welder head would be on constantly. You don't need to jump between features in that kind of a, an example. 
Uh, but, but for, for more complex, complex geometry, you would want to have the automatic trigger built into, so you, you're turning the welder on and off as you need to. So that's, that's a brief overview. We'll get to play with um, finishing the, the printers, going through quality control. So the last thing I just wanted to cover beyond scaling the universal axis is the quality control. And say you built your, your 3D printer with a universal axis and universal controller, what exactly are you testing for so you know the thing works? Um, uh, do some kind of a calibration file. I don't really write, Banshee is like the typical one, but that's like, that's old, that's, there's better, way better stuff right now. Uh, that little boat thing, that's uh, a little outdated. So what's, what's mo the modern, um, what's the more modern thing to do? Let's talk about this. So, calibration. So what do you need to test for? Square. You need to test that you're printing at right angles. That's not guaranteed because it depends how you mount your axes. How do you test for square? What's what's a test print for square? Who can answer that question? Cube. You can do a cube. Uh, tell me more about that cube. Uh, tell me exactly what you're going to do. What's the quickest, most efficient way to test square with a print test print file? Print a cube and measure the the sizes, the the measure the, the dimensions of the cube. Okay, but let's let's go more specific. Square in the X Y plane. Because first you got to make sure that the x-axis is parallel to y because you attach that to your your mounting board. What if you attached it at a not a 90 degree angle, which is very likely because unless you measure carefully, you can't tell. Even if you measure perfectly, now you run the printer and it might be slightly off. So you do want to do a test print for square. Uh, cube gets you the third dimension, which is z. I would just do a square shape as large as possible six by so um, not a small cube um, not a infill cube just a contour so we should everybody should do this we should do a so so do this so this is the So what did I draw there? This is the print bed. And this is your print. Do something like that. That will be the most accurate way to do it because you can measure and then if it's like test for square calibration print. What does it allow you to do? You can actually measure if that, you take a protractor or a square and measure if what you printed is actually square using a tool. If you do a cube, yeah, you can do a cube, but um, all you need is this. A cube would take you much longer to print. Here it's just like a minute. And then you do this done with, the, with this, done with a square. So how about um, perpendicular in a Z direction? Because maybe you didn't mount the thing on straight. So let's test for perpendicular in a Z direction. What do we do for that? Uh, why don't we extend this print to, to get us that too? So how about we go into freak and actually draw that out? So what do we draw? Uh, I would draw here's what I would do. <clears throat> so here's my test print that's let's say 5.5 inches, because the bed is six, so you don't you can't really go all the way to six. You can go 5.5. 
you can go <clears throat> 5.5 like that well you probably want to do so how do you can this slice in Cura no well first you, you got to make it into a, a shape that actually okay. can get an SDL so what you want to do is you probably want to do um, you can't, I mean, lines are tricky, so so what you want to do is take that same sketch and and do like an inset sketch, like point, like 1.2 millimeters, because that's the w nozzle thickness. So the distance between there and there, so our shape would have to be something like, uh, that's 1.2 millimeter, that's our default, no. <laughs> 1.2 millimeter is, um, this is where we got to switch to. So we go to Google it 1.2 millimeter to inches. 0.047. So about 0.05. Uh, so let's do 0.05. And then do this one. And then if we constrain this corner here, so this could probably print, um, put it like 0 0.05. So, so this we call it our square calibration file. The Benchy doesn't get you this. You can't get any right angle correctness from Benchy, the, the, the boat. So let's take this. Do you think we can do this? Can we slice this in Cura? So go to go to Lulzbot Cura, download Cura app image that's on a wiki. If you don't have this, I strongly suggest you do this. Don't mess with Ultimaker or Cura. It's much more complicated. Um, and you definitely don't need it for entry level. So now we're gonna slice this. So what do you do? What's the process? You slice it, so you got this little thing, file, you have to select on it, and then file export it as STL. And now you got your uh, square, square calib file, that STL. So now we're gonna put that into, into here. Look at that. Now you can slice it and, and do it. So that's cool. Uh, you can literally take a, take a right angle or a speed square. Well, take a right angle and see if it's exactly 90 degrees on, both, on two sides. And that will tell you. Now, what else can you get out of this? You can also say if that was 5.5 inches, measure the sides, measure that they're exactly 5.5. Not 5.4, 5.6. They got to be 5.5. And what will that that mean? That means if well, let's write this down. So let's let's do this. So slice this. So get this calibration file. I'm gonna save this. So it's already saved. Um, yeah. So so that's saved. <clears throat> so download. Like actually, you know, download this thing. Okay, where's my uh, see if I could find my doc here so I'll upload this I'm, I'm gonna upload this right now so you can download it right now so square Calib okay so it's on the wiki right now square Calib file can go into recent wiki changes and you can download it through up upload log and it'll, sh it'll show up right here, square calib file. But download it, put it into Lulzbot Cura, and slice it. You, you slice it, and then you can print it on your printer. How do we test this also for the Z straightness? Well, how about let's, let's do, do a vertical feature on this that's straight up. Um, 
So do that. Why don't we put like a little um, little feature on it and just make it go straight up? I mean, ideally you can do something like what happened there. The simplest, easiest would be do that. So you put this feature right on this, and it's going to be like 1.2 millis. It's just a point. Well, a point is hard to print. We might want to make it a little easier because that gets into a, a next level of printing, which is like your cooling. Well, let's try it anyway. This is a hard thing to do, like a point sticking way up. Um, so we can go take that out to 5.5 inches. So what do we got? We got that. How about we print that? That's a very hard print because that means if you can print this straight up like that on a point, that means your printer is really good. Um, if you are not that, maybe we'll test it what happens in real life, but try this. I mean, try it. Uh, I'll say this right now and see if that if our printer is actually capable of something this that's definitely a hard print and uh, he, I will explain why um, you need to have a stationary bed like it's obvious if the bed is moving so most of the printers out there the bed is moving once you get up high like this then the thing will vibrate like crazy and you won't be able to print on our printer the bed is fixed it only moves up and down so you can print a very tall thing like this as tall as you like because the bed is not moving it's just moving uh, straight up and down though if you are adjusting yeah like everything would have to be perfect for the nozzle like once you're up say like a foot two feet three feet four feet wow that's gonna get really tricky to be able to keep on that point right you can think that that gets to be super tricky um, but try this as an XYZ calibration file to know whether your Z axis is straight up and down and whether your XY is perpendicular. So we can start with that. Um, now, what else? What else do you want to do to, to test out here? Um, next thing would be things like overhangs. Is your print cooling working? What kind of overhang can you get to? So what I would do actually here is I would um, do this extremely hard thing only up to two inches so there you go but let's go to the top of it and draw a thing of an angle uh, well right here let's say and let's draw an angle like 45 we should be able to do no problem no problem man it better um, if you can't do 45 that's pretty lame uh, so let's do let's try a 45 by making an angle first of all the angle has to be 90 um, this angle you want to be 90 this one and that one you're parallel and this one and that one you want to be parallel so you got this thing um, well, this thing could still move. Uh, it's not constrained, but let's make that side 1.2 millimeter. No, it's inches 0 0.05. Yeah, so it's actually. Uh, how do you get this to be? We're going to get rid of this thing. Get rid of that parallel there. Oh, oh, let's do one line here that's actually horizontal. So we're like kind of drawing this from scratch. Now you might be able to find. So yeah, make this line horizontal. Um, so then the angle between this and that would be forty-five. There we go. So now you've got a um, <laughs> this. You got this. This. Oh yeah, went the wrong way there. Reverse that. So here's your sample file for for an overhang. 
should be able to do it. And we could keep drawing on top of this and, and do like steeper overhang. We can stop here for this, but I mean, if you get this to print that you've got straight angles, the distance is 5.5, .5, you can do this vertical thing and it's actually still at a right angle. Now two inches, it's a little short to observe whether it's at right angle, but you can kind of see if it's at a right angle. You can still take a, an angle to it. Um, I would do definitely more like um, for this pad here, I would go like four inches actually, because then you can very clearly see um, now this thing just ran away completely. Yeah, I would do four inches. Like if we can get the X, Y, and Z squared like that, and you can print this, don't worry about overhangs yet, because uh, we know that we're pretty good on overhangs. In fact, uh, let me explain why we should be able to get better than 45. So um, just, just so you have the understanding. Oh, here, there. So that's the calibration file. So about overhangs, because you care about it, because that determines how sh shallow, like what kind of features you can print. Overhangs are very important. Overhangs is when there's no substance below, like when you're printing and it hangs over the edge. Um, so take a look at, um, so this is the print layer, right? And that's, what's the height of it? It's, we do typically 0.4, we do with 1.2 nozzle, 0 0.4 layer height. What's that mean? That means you've got plenty of adhesion between the two layers. You're melting into the layer below every time you print. Now, you can print this, that's the second layer. You can't print this, that's over the edge, that has nothing to attach to. You can't print this. like this will fall. As long as you have any kind of overlap, you can print, you can keep printing. And if you if your blower fan is high and you're going slow, you can get like pretty far. In other words, my claim to you is that if you've got the parameters of 0.4 layer height, which is represented here because the height is about one third of the width, This is what one point, like, there'll be like one, one millimeter layer height. If you see that, okay, you can do that. You can do like this kind of height, minimum overlap, poor print, poor adhesion, because you got, so you got to, so the concept here is you got to flatten out the layers to make a lot of interaction, a lot of adhesion between layers. And that's why we do 0.4, which is one third of one, 1.2. One you can go up to all the way like 1.0 and you'll still get, good prints, but your overhangs will not work. So here the claim is, even if you go like this very radical angle, we should be able to get probably like 30 degrees, like that degree there being 30. Um, we should be able to do that. Uh, so basically test the limits. But the idea is as long as you have some overlap and you're going slow, so you have enough time to cool, as long as you attach and cool fast enough, uh, this will work, uh, but what won't work is once you get it off the edge far enough, this will just slant and just drop down. It'll just fall down. If you got like minimal overlap, it might hang, and that's where you get the the crappy edges where it's like you got all this fraying happening on the edges. That's when you don't have enough overlap. But definitely, we should be able like if you do one third, which is. Uh, like this kind of a slope when you overlap one third, overlap by like 0.4 millimeter. Yeah, that should perfectly work, which is pretty good, which means that point being, if you've got a very small layer height, so let's go even to, uh, let's do another slide, duplicate slide. So let's go to 0 0.2 layer height. You can do that. Not a problem. So let's take this case. Um, so we're explaining how do you get radically shallow, uh, like radically steep rather, overhangs. So with 1.2 nozzle, 
point to layer height, the condition then becomes, so now these get squished even more. Like point two is like this, point two is like that. Uh, well, let's copy that one. So we flattened it to point two layer height. Now I'm telling you we should be able to get like even lower angles. Like 10, 20 degrees. Even if you do like point third, like the third overlap. Point is the shallower the height, when you still have good overlap, which is one third of the 1.2, which is 0.4, your angle is going to be radically shallow here. So what I'm claiming here is that with a fat nozzle like 1.2, you can get very steep overhangs. Try it. Let's test the limit. Uh, now what I can tell you is probably when you go on the internet, you can say, hey guys, I'm getting like 10 degree overhang angles. I'm really cool. Yeah, you can probably do that because because that, that's it's pretty hard to do. But I think with our printer, because we're using the large nozzles, we'll be we'll definitely be able to do something close to this. So let's test like what's what's the reality here. So let's take a data point. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Uh, when printing the Z, uh, the the point that we're talking about for the Z, yeah, the, our bed uh, on the universal, the bed's moving. Ah, sorry, right. The universal disadvantage is it's like the rest of them. Yeah, that has a moving bed. It's the simplest design you can do, but disadvantage being the bed is moving. On the Pro, yeah, oh, good point, good point. I, I'm kind of... Uh, misrepresenting here. On the D3D Pro where the bed moves straight up and down, it doesn't move back and forth, that's when you can get the very tall prints. Now, for the this test print here that we've got for this crazy one like this, you can do this but just slow your speed way down. Like slow it down to like maybe like 20% of 100, like one fifth the speed. So it's going to go very slow. But it'll still go up, you know, relatively fast because it's just a point, and it will give it enough time. So go down in speed as much as you can to test the limit of this kind of a structure. I I'm curious. I've never gone through this kind of rigorous testing procedure myself. So let's see what this actually gives us. Does that answer it? Yes, yes. Yeah, so we can do that. Recent wiki chain, I'm going to just upload, um, upload a new version to this file to, to represent my specific uh, update here with the, the vertical part. So if I go onto that, I'm going to upload the new version which is this square calib file. Yeah, so test that. See, uh, you can come up with all kinds of calibration files, but I mean this one right here will get you a lot. Um, get you a lot of info. Uh, circles would be like, you know, how fast can you go around circles? I don't know, that's cool. But, but this will get you dimensionality and ang angularity correctness. So, so that, that gives you just about everything that you need. And it tests the X, the Y, and the Z uh, all at the same time. Um, now, there's a one implicit thing that comes out of this is by, you, what you're also testing in this file is the bed levelness how well your your Z probing is working because if you're going around the whole perimeter of the print and it's not exactly on a printing on a bed surface, in other words, if part of the print is coming off, that means that the probing is not getting accurate results, in which case we would have to troubleshoot it. 
And how do you troubleshoot? Well, make sure that your probe is on tight. Make sure that um, that's really the only thing. And make sure that your bed is not loose. So the way this is going to work efficiently is that if the X, Y, and Z all the wobble, like you can take each axis and see, like, okay, if you take it by hand, is it solid or does it wobble a little bit? And if it does, we may need to put additional tape around the bearings. That's what we do here to make them tighter within the carriages to make a tighter fit around the axes, the, the rods, around the rods. Uh, but that's pretty much the only thing you can do. The, you can, for this to work well, the belts will have to be tight. So that means you would have to make sure the three belts are tight, that the carriages are tight on their, um, the bearings are not wobbling around on the axes. Uh, so you'd have to add tape to the bearings to, to constrain a little more. Um, and then the arrangement of the, the, the bed axis, whether it's perpendicular to the, to the other axis, that, that, that you can adjust. And the last point of adjustment is for the Z, well, if for some reason you did not get the Z structure straight up and down, you might need to like raise one corner like a little bit like put a little shim under one one part of where the z-axis z attaches in order to make it more perpendicular. And uh, yeah, yeah. It could be that, well, I never did this calibration and, and I printed this on a D3D Universal that printed the parts. So maybe uh, th if there's a, an error there that might be that my printer was not straight up and down. So uh, we can correct that, like if we print straight from now on, then uh, all the parts will be straight. So adjustment points are tighten the belts, tighten up the bearings, uh, tighten up any loose screws, like make sure the bed um, is screwed down and all the parts are screwed down properly, and then um, everything should work. There's also, this print file will also test whether the location of where you mounted the bed is correct. So that means you should have equidistant, equidistance between the, the print and the edges. If not, if you, for example, your print actually goes off the bed, that means the bed needs to be adjusted or the end stop location needs to be adjusted so that the zero point makes it fit right on the bed. So that's just like a little bit of messing around there. You can move the bed left and right within its bed holders, like if you're looking from the front. You, you can't move it the way it's mounted. You can move it from side to side, but in the other direction along the axis, the only way you can change the, where the printer prints is by moving the end stop, or possibly by remounting the whole bed axis so it just is in a different location. So you can adjust the, the bed position in one of multiple ways. You can move the entire axis, you can just shift the platform, or you can adjust the end stop. So that's that's the calibration procedure. We did not talk about the step or steps per millimeter. That should be good. I mean, it's been quite good before. But if not, I mean, we might have to adjust. Right now, I think we're like at 100 steps per millimeter within the settings, um, settings file. In other words, the amount of steps the stepper motor takes in order to cover a given distance. That's a property that's set within uh, the firmware. Uh, that should be good, but if not, we can possibly change it. Yeah. So that's about it. Uh, so I'll come down and we can work on the printers, and get everybody finished up and calibrated so we can run this test, test file. And that's about it for today, unless there's any other questions. And I'm really curious about what the minimum layer height, uh, kind of the steepest angle we can print for overhangs, because that means you're printing like almost impossible prints. Um, you're not limited by geometry as much.
there are limits so you can't print in midair you can't print like an infinite long overhang things like that which is important in some cases for whatever part you're printing So let's do this. Let's see what the rebar pricing is. Uh, it used to be about six bucks a stick of twenty. Let's see what what we got right now. Not too bad. Maybe went up a dollar. Twenty percent. Not like a hundred percent. Cost of OSB, I'll look at the link. It's, uh, yeah, it's 32. We're pretty much doubling the wall, the wall siding price at the cost of infinite of uh, lifetime. Yeah, that's a hit. Now this may mean, right now we are at 43,000 for the bill materials we did for the last one. We might be up at 50,000 for the full bill materials with this kind of change. Close to 50, maybe another 4k or so that this will add 5k um, for the siding. We need for, like um, 48 sheets times 30, 40 times 30. No, it's only 1,000, it's only 2,000 more. So we're gonna go from 43k to 45k in BOM cost for the house, assuming everything else is the same. Um, so 40 sheets times up to $50. Yeah, yeah. The siding for the whole house is like 2000 Not too bad. Um, all right. We'll get going here. And in the afternoon, we'll be building the torch table. Oh, yes. That'd be great.